to our service this morning. Trust that uh, trust that you've been blessed in being here in, in, here already with the song service. I it sounded good from up here. I love Christmas songs. I love singing Christmas songs here. Uh, welcome to the visitors. Trust that you'll also be blessed in in worshiping here this morning. It's a blessing. The the church is well filled this morning. I I gotta say this. I feel sorry for you sitting way in the back. It seems like we are kind of disconnected from this far away, so maybe it's not so, but it seems that way from here. Anyhow, uh, a welcome to everyone. Uh, Judge just told me that he wanted to mention where Brother Mark is this morning. Brother Mark is in Agape this morning. Um, they are planning to install an elder this evening, I believe. It, it's tonight, right, Judge? Tonight, yeah. So they had a service this morning leading up to that. So again, a uh, welcome to everyone here this morning. There was a uh, seminary professor and his wife, and they were on vacation in the Smoky Mountains. And they were sitting there eating breakfast one morning in this small restaurant. And a guy walked in the restaurant, and he kind of came along the tables, and he talked to different people, and greeted different people, and he could tell, they could tell that they knew each other, and he came down through, and was joyful, and you could just tell that he was a kind of a guy that you love being around. And he come up to their table, to this professor's table, and start talking to them. And when he heard that this man was a professor, a seminary professor, he said, can I tell you a story? And before the couple could answer, he had pulled up a chair and he sat down. And, uh, and he says, you know, over there, over there at the base of that mountain, he said, there's a small village, a small town over there. And he said, in that small town, years, some years, years ago, there's a little boy born. And he said, this little boy never knew his father. He never knew who his father was. And he said, you know, in a small town where everybody knows everybody, and everybody knows everybody's Franschhoft family, it was awkward for not knowing, for that little boy not to know who his father was. And he said that one day, this little boy and his mother went to church. And they had a new pastor in church. And after church, the pastor met them at the door, greeting many of the people for the first time. And as this little boy and the mother walked out, the mother said her name. And then, of course, he looked at the young son and he said, So who's your father? And this gentleman said, I don't know, was it the look on the blush on the mother's face? Was it the downcast eyes of the boy, the son? But some, something told this pastor Immediately that he had struck a chord that hurt. He'd struck an area that hurt. And he said this pastor got down, got down eye level with the boy. And he looked him in the face and he said, you know what? I should have never asked. I should have never asked who your father is. You have such a close resemblance of your dad. You are a child of God. You're a child of God. You're a son of the king. You have an inheritance that is heaven. You're a son of the king. Live up to that name. You're a son of the king. You're a child of God. The man said, and I left that place. I was that little boy. 
I was that little boy. And I left that place, and I was never the same. The man stood up, pushed his chair in, and left. And this seminary professor was like, wow, who is that man? So they flagged down a waitress. And they asked the waitress, did you see that man that was in here? That man that came around here and talked to many of the people in the restaurant this morning, do you know who he was? Do you have any idea who that man was? She said, oh, yes, I know who he was. He said, that was our former governor. Our former governor, I think his name was Ben Hoover or something like that. He was governor of Tennessee. I wonder, I'm not sure if I said this, but the man said that had that pastor not spoke, spoken those words of life to me as a young boy, I'm not sure if I ever would have amounted to anything. But he said, I lived on that. I'm a child of God. I'm a son of the king. And by the way he talked to the people that morning, he believed that. My friends, you and I have something to rejoice in, do we not? We're a child of God, a son of the king. We have an inheritance that, man, that matches none other because we are a child of God. In my last message, I talked about the tongue. And I don't know if you remember or not, but we to, we, I, I, I talked about the tongue. I took the pa passage in James 3, and we talked about the tongue. And, and the, the, James 3 says, The tongue is a little member, boasts its great things. Behold, what a great, how great a little matter of, how a little matter, matter a little fire kindleth. Ta we talked about the tongue a lot. So this morning, I wanted to share that story with you because of what that meant to that little boy. Those words were never forgotten. They were words of encouragement. And they were never forgotten. They were spoken in that young man's life. And it stirred life within him. And he lived off of those words for how long? For the rest of his life. My title of my message this morning is The Power of Encouraging Words. And I'm going to be taking just a few verses out of Proverbs here in a little bit. But the word encouragement. I want to just, just briefly talk about the word encouragement. Because I, I love the word. I love the word encouragement. And if you, if you think about it, it's like courage. The word courage, I want to read a few verses out of Joshua where God told Joshua to be courageous. So encourage is the word courage. And it's encourage. It's like me telling Judd, be encouraged. I want to put courage in Judd. In Judd. I want to put courage in you. Encourage each other. So it's like stirring life. Stirring life within us. That's how encouragement works. Again, the title this morning, The Power of Encouraging Words. In Joshua, I want you to get this. Joshua replaced Moses. Let me just read a few verses here. And this is not necessarily my text, but I want to I touch on this. It says like this here in Joshua 1, verse 1. And after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. Moses was the servant of the Lord. And after his death, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, go over the Jordan River, and you and all this people into the land which I have given them to the people of Israel. And every place... the soul of your foot will tread upon I have given unto you as I promised Moses in other words Joshua I want you to go lead out I want you to be the leader now Moses is gone and I want you to be the leader this is what I want to get to in verse three, 6 he says this God tells this to Joshua he says be strong and of good courage for you shall 
For you shall cause this people to inherit the land which I have sworn to their fathers to give them. Be, of, be strong and be of good courage. Because I want your people to have this, to inherit this land which I have given them. My friends, we can encourage one another so that we can enter into a promised land that we can inherit. Why? Somebody tell me why. Because we are what? Child of God. We are a son of the king. Let's encourage each other. And let's encourage the people that don't know that they have a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then in verse 7, he says this. This is the very next verse. He says, only be strong and very courageous. God tells him that. In verse 9, he says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Be not frightened, neither dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And he was. He was with him wherever he went. Be strong and very courageous. My friends, encouragement, speaking encouraging words, is stirring life in people. Now, if you would, turn with me, and I just want to read a few verses out of Proverbs 18. Proverbs verse 18, just a few words, uh, verses here, just to bring our thoughts to the power of words. If you would, stand with me, and we will read Proverbs 18, Verse 21, Proverbs 18, 21, and 22. Those two verses. Proverbs 18, verse 21. Death and life in the power are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor in the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we can be called your child. We thank you that we can be called a son of the king. We thank you for the inheritance you have for us. Now we thank you for these few verses here that I read this morning about the power of the tongue and about the power of words and words of encouragement. Lord, I pray that you would guide, you would lead, you would direct this morning as we go through the message. Pray that your name would be glorified, your name would be lifted up. And pray that we could go from here just, just simply being encouraged. Guide us and lead us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Interesting. Interesting statement, is it not? He says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. Then he says... They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. The story that I just told you about that, about that former governor, that governor was eating the fruit thereof, right? The power of the tongue. He was living off of that life that was stirred within him. And he was living on that. And that is the fruit thereof. The person that said, sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never hurt you. We probably all heard that line already, right? That phrase. Sticks and stones can break you bone, your bones, but words can never hurt you. You know what? That person must have never been called a loser Stupid, lazy bum, whatever. Because words have the power to hurt. They have the power to wound, but they also have a power to heal. Think of it this way, on words. If we... Uh,
Think about someone that you enjoy being around. Think about someone that you enjoy interacting with. Think about someone that we all have people we enjoy interacting with, right? The odds are that person speaks life to you. That person gives you insight. That person, sp- we heard about wisdom this morning. We heard a lot about wisdom. It was very, very good. Thank you, Brother Dan, and also Brother Marion for teaching our Sunday school class. Very good job. Wisdom and, and words go hand in hand, right? They do. But the chances are that person speaks wisdom to you, and you enjoy being with them. And after you spend time with them, I, and this is just me thinking, as I was studying for this, I thought, you know what, after <clears throat> spending time with someone that we enjoy conversating with, talking to, you kind of walk away from there and you're refreshed, right? It kind of feels like, uh, I thought of this way. Maybe it's May. We're in December now. But it's May. The grass is green, the flowers are blooming, and then Along comes this nice spring rain. Following that, the sun comes out. And everything is green and the flowers are blooming. The sun, warm sun, sun comes out and everything looks so beautiful. Maybe there's even a few mushrooms that are popping or growing. Or, but that's kind of how we feel, refreshed. If we're around someone that can speak life to us. Stirring life in each other. It's interesting that the author here says this. He says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Then he says this. The next verse, he says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor of the Lord. Huh, interesting, is it not? He talks about the power of the tongue and eating the fruits of the power of the tongue. But then he says, then then his thoughts, then his mind go to marriage. He says a wife finds a good thing. I'm going to borrow a phrase from Max Licato. Listen to this. This is what he says, and this is very, very true. He says, the more intimate the relationship, the more powerful the words. Let me say that again. This is, quote, the more intimate the relationship, the more powerful the words. My friends... There's no place, nowhere, where word management is more important than in our homes. Did you follow that? There's no other place where word management is more important than your home and my home. Why? Because the more intimate the relationship the more powerful the words. Let me explain. Let me put it this way. This is the best way I could put it. You may have a different, different way of looking at it. If I'm driving, if I'm driving through a town, I'm driving through Canton, okay? And I'm driving, the traffic's heavy, and somebody doesn't like my driving... They may pull up next to me and maybe I have my window down, I don't, you know, and they toot their horn and they say, hey, stupid. I don't like it, right? Nah, I don't. None of us would. We wouldn't like it. But you know what? You wouldn't like it if you were driving and somebody toots your horn and yells at you. But you know what? You don't know that person. That person doesn't know you. He has no idea how brilliant you are. He has no idea how wise you are. 
He has no idea of all that you have accomplished in life. He doesn't know all that. And you can kind of brush it off. That's really nothing. You know, he, yeah, that was just him. And you can forget about it. But if, but if your spouse, if your father, if your parent, if your close friend, if somebody that knows you very well says, hey, stupid, why'd you do that? You know what? You may pretend it didn't hurt. You may pretend it didn't hurt. It still hurt a little bit. It hurt more than the guy that tooted the horn at me. It did. It did. You know what? If you say, oh, it's just a joke, forget that. If you have to say it's just a joke, there really was a little truth to it. The more intimate the relationship, the more powerful the words. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And what we have said here this morning, I hope it makes sense. Does it make sense? Does it make sense? Common sense, right? It makes, com I'm going to say common sense. It does. I believe it does. But let me take it a step further. I believe, I believe this. I believe that it also makes spiritual sense. I really do. Let me, again, let me explain. If I, if you, if I say something negative about someone, if I say something negative to a person, maybe it's in their face, maybe it's around their back, if I say something negative to them, let me, let me just ask you, who am I, who are you agreeing with? Where, where's that source coming from? Remember, child of God? Are we a child of God? If we say something negative, and if we say call someone something, whatever it may be, who are we agreeing with? What does, I had to ask myself, what does Jesus Christ think about that person? Let's put it that way. What does Jesus think about that person? His love, his grace, his mercy is extended to everyone, right? And Jesus loves, Jesus' desire is for every person to be saved, right? Can we say amen? I mean, it is. He wants everyone to be saved. That's what he wants for that person. He wants him to be saved. He loves him, her, whatever it may be. His desire is that not one person would go to hell. That's the desire of Jesus Christ. And that's how he loves that person. He has a desire that every soul be saved. Now let me just ask you one more question here. What about our enemy? What about our enemy? What about Satan? What does he think of that person? What is his desire? Satan's desire is that not one person be saved. His desire is that I would put that person, whoever I'm thinking about, put that person down. Is that correct? That I would destroy him, right? Mm -hmm. That's Satan's desire. That's what he would want me to do. That's what he would want to, us to do. That's his desire, that every person would go to hell because that's where he will end up at. My question again to you now is this. So if I slander someone, 
Again, the power of words. If I put someone down, who am I agreeing with? It's pretty blunt, isn't it? It is. I agree it is. But who am I agreeing with? Where is it coming from? Who am I agreeing with? Jesus said this. Jesus said this. Listen to this. John 8, 44, he said, this, he said this about Satan. He said, he's a murderer from the beginning. He has, nothing, he has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature. He is a liar and he is a father of all lies. That's what Jesus said about the enemy, Satan. Satan comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he's a liar and the father of lies. That's what our enemy does. That's him. So for me, words. For you, words. Let's be careful that we do not kill hope in a person. Let's be careful that we do not kill hope in a person. Let's be careful that we do not steal dreams. Let's be careful that we not kill self-esteem. Those are all things the enemy would want us to do. But my friends, if we speak life, if we speak life to someone, they can live off of that. Remember my story in the beginning about the young boy that was told that he's a child of the king, he's a child of God? We can live off of that. If we bless someone, we're agreeing with God. And we will bring the best out of them. Our words, our words become a tool of the Holy, the Holy Spirit. The person that we encourage can find joy and peace and fulfillment. And we are partnering with God. That's what He would want us to do. Partner with God. And encourage someone. I found this kind of humorous when I was studying. I said, a little boy once said once, he said, Dad, he said, let's throw darts. I throw the darts and you say wonderful. All of us needs a wonderful once in a while, right? We do. Every one of us needs a wonderful. Dad, you, I'll throw the darts and you say wonderful. Every one of us needs that little bit of encouragement at times. There's numerous verses here. Uh, that I would like to read yet. Yeah, let me read a couple out of Hebrews. Hebrews 10.24. Let us consider how to stir up one another in love and good works. Not neglect, neglecting the meeting together as a habit of some is, but encouraging one another in all the more as you see the day drawing near. And he, what he's saying here in Hebrews is this. As the body of Christ, let's encourage one another, speak courage to the to each other as the day. The day is the day that Jesus Christ returns. That's what he's talking about. Let's encourage each other as the day draws near. And I have, I only have a few minutes left, but what if? And I'm going to go to an Old Testament story, and I just want to touch on this a little bit. There's times when you and I are kind of at rock bottom. And you know what? There may not be anyone there to encourage us that day. We might be kind of on our own. And there may not be anyone there to kind of lift our spirits that day. Have you ever been there? I think we all have. I think there's all been t- we've all had times when we are like, wow, God, what, what did I get myself into now? David. King David the one that was anointed king in 1 Samuel chapter 30. Let me, just, let me just talk about this. David and his men, he has 600 men, and they left the little town of Ziglag, and they left that town to go fight. And when they came back, it says, my notes here, It says when they came back, they found Ziglag, the town that they had left to go fight. They found it burned to the ground. And it says that David 
lifted his voice and he wept. Let me just, let me just put it this way. As David and his 600 men returned to town, they were probably all looking forward to seeing their families, of seeing their spouses, of seeing their children. But before they get there, a couple miles out, they see smoke. They sm see smoke rising, and they were like, that smoke is not possible just cooking fires. Possibly not just cooking fires. It's probably something else. And they get closer. Why are not some children or somebody, why are they not coming out to meet us? They come to their town, and they see that everything is burnt, and there's not one person there anymore. They had all been captured, been taken away. And remember, this is one man's fault, and it's David's fault, because David is the reason these 600 men are there. And, they, and the Bible tells us they lifted their voices and they wept until, until they could weep no more. And then they turn on David and they, say, they tell David they're going to stone him. David is at the bottom. David has nowhere to turn. Ari's support was gone. Except, the Bible tells us this. He tells us that David strengthened himself in the Lord. His own men were against him. His own men were going to stone him. His wife was gone. His children were gone. And it, the Bible tells us that David strengthened himself in the Lord. My friends, there's times... When you and I will be broken. We'll be broken. And maybe that, that's where David was. He was broken. He was totally broken. And I, and I, and I assume that's where God wanted him at this time. And David sought the Lord. He prayed. And I had to, I, just in my mind, I had to ask, what well, would... The Bible just simply tells us that David sought the Lord. And, and to, to finish the story, um, they, long, long story short, they, to finish the story, David and his men went after the army that had captured their wives and children. Nobody had been killed. They got all their possessions back and actually more than they had taken. And they got their wives and their families back. Let me ask you, I had to ask myself, what did David, how did he strengthen himself? In the Lord. You know, David had been, well, first of all, let me say this David was bold enough to ask. David was bold enough to come to the Lord and ask for help. And you know what? Same for us. If we're broken, let's be bold enough to just say, God, here I am. Lord, here I am. I need help. I'm at the end of myself. Lord, I need help. Here I am. David has had trials before, and I had to think of this as well. He's had had trials before, and every time, somehow the Lord helped him. Think about Goliath. The odds against David and Goliath, for David to kill, kill Goliath, it should never happen, right? But God was with him. So he could, he could remember things that the Lord had helped him through. And through those things, David. I put in my notes here, I put like this here. David was in a bad spot in his life. He was. And there's times when we're in a bad spot in our life. But let's strengthen ourselves in the Lord and remember all the good that the Lord has done for us Let's remember all that he has promised us. Let's remember this. You are a child of God. You are a son of the king. Son, daughter of the king. That's really who we are. And let's claim that. My friends, if we are at rock bottom, nowhere to turn like David, 
Let's strengthen. There's a lot more we could say about this, but let's strengthen ourselves in the Lord. So in, just in closing, let's just remember, let's strengthen ourselves in the Lord. But also let's remember life and death is in the power of the tongue. And let's remember the power is we can encourage someone. And if somebody is at rock bottom and if we see they're at rock bottom, let's put courage into them to keep going. Stand with me for a closing prayer. Lord Jesus, again, we thank you so much that we can be a child of God, a son of the king. We thank you so much for your scripture that we can look into and and everything that we can get out of your scripture, we thank you for that. We thank you for all the encouragement that we can get out of scripture. And we thank you that we can strengthen ourselves in you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for that. Thank you for meeting us here this morning. We bless you.